Hi everyone, I am Dr. Ko. Today I will continue with the Chapter 5 of Chronic Kidney Disease Management Handbook, which is Progressive CPD. Um, that means that um, we need to get involved um, more other providers than ourselves. So in this case, we are talking about referral to a nephrologist. So indication for nephrologists are written there. Um, it is more in the like guidelines rather than a dictation that um, since the mention or the criteria I'm saying that um, if we refer like there are criteria there however if we refer too early um, and then that's a necessary load on the specialist services if we refer too late and then there is not really any point sometimes uh, you may diagnose someone with uh, limited life expectancy such as people with multi comorbidities and who is residing in a nursing home or who are more more or less palliative care setting you may not want to refer to them at least it's important to get the review. So by referring them early, we can reduce progression of the disease and we can reduce morbidity, modality or quality of life improve. We can reduce the rate of hospitalization uh, and set the expectation for the patient and the family members. And in, in the context of dialysis or kidney transplant, that can be done on time. So if we look at these, these are the recommendations. So let's say EGFR is less than 30%, so stage 4 or stage 5. And, uh, and it has to be not due to acute renal failure, but if it is acute renal failure, this person should to be in hospital anyway. And there is persistent significant albuminuria uh, that is in the context of diabetes or any other protein urea requires referral and there is sustained decrease in EGFR within 12 months and that's no good and that uh, CKD with not just with hypertension any other medical condition for example diabetes with poorly control you would refer to endo and um, renal physician anyway so that's need to consider. So in terms of not necessary is that if it is over 30% with um, there is no not much protein in the urine and everything stable, the person has good quality of life. And then, I mean, you can manage based on what is recommended in this book. So it's quite, quite, uh, yeah, you can manage it more in your in your own clinic, uh, you will need to review frequently, but uh, you can, yeah, it is uh, important to know what your limits are. Now, this is very good point. Uh, each of the state has the referral uh, requirement. In Victoria, we use the electronic referral and it applies the statewide criteria. So things like blood tests, protein, uh, urine tests, and um, ultrasound are at least at least require. So it mentioned of anyone with a rapid decline of kidney function or acute nephritis require uh, medical emergency. It is quite common in the context of heart failure uh, more than anything else. Um, someone might be noticing reduced urine output, you do the blood tests, then, then you notice acute renal failure. It could be related with other illness, sepsis as well, or injuries. So what options are available for stage five kidney disease? So the it is important to inform the patients that if you are referring to a specialist, what type of treatment are they going to provide? Um, my basic principle is that uh, you only refer to for doing things that you cannot do yourself here in your clinic. Uh, things like explanation and supporting the person are something uh, pa patients or 
family members will expect you to do that. Yes, the specialist team will do that too, but um, in general sense, they may not know the person long enough or thorough enough like you do. So the uh, renal replacement has two forms, the uh, surgical and medical. That's the way I remember it. Medical is dialysis and surgical is the transplant. And there is that what they call renal supportive care, RSC. So what does it involve is usually uh, nurses, community health care, palliative care, and ally help to support the quality of life. So treatment options, uh, you can actually print out this sheet. Now my head is covering this bit. So start with comprehensive conservative kidney care. So they, they are usually people who are waiting for transplant or that doesn't need that red yet. Um, supported by the other team members. So they're usually what, what you are doing already, medication and eye control, advanced care planning and symptom and responding to uh, symptoms that are associated with it. At the same time, be proactive and monitoring them. So this is important. Um, so we need to know uh, limitation of what we can do and at the same time limitation of therapies that we recommend. So if the person is uh, has very limited life expectancy, would you really make them go through all the um, complicated medical procedures that may not make them live longer or improve quality of life? So home peritoneal dialysis. So there is continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, CAPD, and automated peritoneal. Um, so they are usually four or more daytime bags, changed manually, and then the other is overnight. Since this is more convenient, um, the, yeah, the infection risks are there, but um, need to be able to turn at home. So that's peritoneal. And then we would do with the blood. Uh, we will need blood um, from a vein and artery. So that is done daytime and takes four to six hours on a day. And nighttime is that three to eight hours per week. So it is kind of like an appreciation that our kidneys are doing day in and day out 24 seven to keep our body functioning. I suppose the same apply to our heart as well. We only value them if they are no longer working. So the blood has been cleaned by the artificial filter. So yeah, we need fistula for that. And it need to be wait three months before able to do center base uh, hemodialysis. So it is good if the person doesn't uh, or not able, able to maintain their own dialysis themselves. Um, that's very crucial part of that in many remote Australian regions. And transplant is that, um, yeah, you take a kidney from another person. So there are a lot more steps involved than receiving dialysis, however, and also will require um, lifelong immunosuppressants. So um, there are a lot of support is required before and after transplant. One thing is that higher infection rate and cancer rate. So that's need to know due to the immunosuppressant, I suppose. So these are the links that are available, which is um, you can print out and give it to the person or you can give them a link these days. So shared decision making is important. Um, that is to make what to do since this is a life changing medical treatment. 
uh, once you commit to it, you need to do it properly. So this is very good five question. Um, I read it and then I realized that we are already doing that for our day-to-day -day practice. There is nothing new here. So what will happen if we watch and wait? Um, so it's the same as if someone present with a medical problem. That's what you think it is good for problem solving as well as like um, KFP clinical reasoning skill. What are the tests and treatment options? What are the benefit and harm? And what are the benefit and harm? Wait up to you and then wait up to the person. And the number five is the most important. Do you have enough information to make a choice? Sometime um, our ability to do our job are limited by what information is available than whether we can actually make decision or not. So the same as any uh, incurable medical condition, uh, sorry, I should say incurable and progressive medical condition, advanced care planning is crucial. Um, so the, it is, it's, I mean, we should be doing everyone with health assessment over 65 anyway. And um, you may always have feedback, oh, I'm, I'm still alive, I'm not going to die tomorrow. And then, uh, well, you can say that, well, that's exactly why you need to do that. Because there is no point if you and someone is in their dying days, since they may not be able to make a clear decision whether what they want to do. So these are criteria that would uh, make sense to do um, advanced care planning. So if the person has existing medical condition that will reduce life expectancy, two or more significant comorbid conditions, poor functional status, chronic malnutrition, and poor quality of life. So, in general, if EGFI is less than 60, it is the time you should start having this conversation. It is very rough guide, and uh, I mean, it can go, it cannot go wrong. Um, then you can always offer, and the person may refuse or doesn't want to talk about it. That's fine. So, after advanced care planning, um, so the they, they even mention of three topics here. So one is appropriate referral, two is that managing the other cardiovascular risk factor, that should include diabetes as well, and medication consideration. So, uh, and this is more in the um, palliative care context. Um, so they said we can manage it successfully in our clinic room, um, the, you can always email, phone, or letter, send a letter to specialist, touch base, doesn't need um, frequent referral, especially if you are in the bush, uh, that's quite applicable to RVTS registrars or any rural doctors, um, that is that a good option if you know what you're doing. So. Um, and general decline in the EGFR is uh, quite maybe age appropriate. However, we need to rule out any other reversible factors. With the cardiovascular risk, it's the same as um, any other chronic medical condition, lifestyle and pharmaceutical management. So a mention of the goal of the treatment is to improve function and quality of life. At the same time, we don't want to be too aggressive for, I mean, since you may not achieve anything meaningful and you, you could end up, doesn't take much to have dehydration or, and then patient's blood pressure would drop. So we need to understand what is the acceptable level for the one person or to another. So medication consideration is diminishing tolerance of side effects and more and more drug interactions. So that's really important to consider. 
specially medication that are metabolized in the kidney and liver, which are almost everything. And polypharmacy is a common risk. So the if the person may have a heart disease, they may be on four or five medication already. If you have diabetes, there may be two to three. Um, and most of them have bowel issue and um, cough, as well as <laughs> vitamin D and calcium. So uh, most of the patients might be taking at least 10 medications. And what can we do? Are they really needed? Now, there is no right or wrong answer here. And at the end of the day, um, it really depends on the person's choice. I have too many elderly with four or five multivitamins. And um, I inform them about um, limited use at after a certain age and their situations, but they're still keen on taking that. So that's a person's choice. Generally, re yeah, dose reduction need to be considered, even if the varieties are maintained. So this is all about chapter five. So it involved referral to specialists and consideration for what to do with stage four and stage five kidney disease. Um, that's about chapter five. Hopefully you find that useful. If you find that very useful, please click like or put a comment section if you think there is some improvement need to be done. Have a good afternoon. Bye bye.